hide. It was covered with brass or some other metal to blunt the arrows or darts hurled by the enemies. The darts, flaming with fire, would strike the shield. If indeed the soldier was careful enough and alert and could keep his shield poised against the onslaught of the enemy. But we want to notice in particular the darts. They were arrows, sometimes aflame, shot by the enemy into the company, and thus the Apostle Paul tells us that we're to expect this from the devil. He likens the temptations, the efforts, and the attacks of the devil upon us as fiery darts. Yet we are told we can repel these things with the shield of faith. How do we get faith tonight or this morning? How do we get this shield? The apostle Paul says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it all goes back to the word of God. This we must strive to do too if we are ever to make it through this world of weal and woe and finally with weary tread step over the threshold into our Father's home, into that land beyond the sunset's radiant glow it's far fairer than this. Listen, if you ever get there, it will be by making a fight. Now, let me assure you of that. The Christian life is not a picnic, it's not a vacation, and it's not a love feast all the time, as some people would have you believe. The Christian life is a fight, and there are some things we must fight. The reason we must fight is because we're being attacked on every side by the devil and by all of his forces. Thus, from his arsenal, the darts, flaming with fire, as it were, are shot constantly at the people of God. And we have only one way to repel these things. That is by the shield of faith, which comes to us from the Word of God. This is the very picture that the text suggests to us, a fighting person, a militant person, not some soft-soaping, willow-tailed fellow that has no fight in him whatsoever, but somebody who stands up. Satan's fiery darts after our song. When Jesus comes Linwood retells, a long time ago in our church building as a little boy, I used to hear this song, and somehow it settled deeply in my heart, and I've never quite outgrown the idea of it. My soul be on thy guard, ten thousand foes arise, the hosts of sin are pressing hard to draw thee from the skies. Oh, watch and fight and pray, the battle ne'er give o'er, renew it boldly every day and help divine implore. Ne'er thank the victory won, 
nor lay thine armor down. The work of faith will not be done till thou obtain the crown. Fight on, my soul, till death shall bring to thee, shall bring thee to thy God. He'll take thee at thy parting breath to his divine abode. I want to talk for a little while about some of these fiery darts that the devil is undoubtedly hurtling at the church and at every individual member. I could never mention all of them, but may I mention some of the more obvious ones? The first thing I want to mention, the devil is hurling at the church of God with much success and with telling effects is a spirit of conformity to the world. The devil's winning more church members with that very dart than any other I know. We've got some modern agents of the devil walking about the country telling us we're making religion a little bit too narrow, a little bit too straightened. We're screwing them down a little too tight and alienating too many people. They say, listen, let's get with it in these modern enlightened days in which we're living and let's broaden the spectrum of this thing. Let's loosen up a bit. Let's liberalize the thing. Let's allow more things than we've allowed before. Let's have more Christian liberty. Let's allow the church members to do what they want to do and you'll have a church house full of people if you do that. We're going to have a big crowd if you'll let folks do pretty well what they want to do. You see, if you'll do like that, the church will be big and the church will be imposing and the church will be something really noticeable in the community. I'll tell you, if you've got a church full of that sort of members, you haven't got a thing. You've got a great big church that's as weak as branch water. You've got people who are not doing one iota of good for the cause of Christ. Now, if the Bible teaches me anything, it teaches me that the members of the Lord's church are to be a separate people. They are to be a different people. And when we lower the standards and we let down the gap in this direction, we're going to let the world in with all of its evils. The church is going to be reduced to a simple nothingness. Today, we become so broad-minded and so likable and so much like other people until there's not much difference between church members and rank worldly people. About the only difference is you go to your church and they go to theirs. And some folks want to remove that difference even nowadays. Well, I understand that Christian people are to be a separate people. There are some things we simply cannot partake of. There are some ways we cannot conform to and some things and places that we simply cannot tolerate if we're going to be members of the Lord's church and if we're going to be followers of His. The Apostle Paul still says in Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, the same thing he said 1,900 years ago. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There are a few words in this text that church members need to keep in their minds. They need to keep constantly in their hearts. And that is conformed and transformed. Now we've reversed it a little bit too much in our modern thinking. Paul is telling church members that you are not to be conformed, but you are to be transformed. Not to be conformed is to take on the likeness or to be shaped after the likeness of the thing with which you are surrounded. In other words, Take on the likeness of these various situations, styles, customs, practices, whatever. Lots of folks think we ought to nowadays. He said, don't you do that. But he said, the thing you want to do if you're going to be triumphant, if you're going to be a person who's going to make it in the great after while is to be a transformed person. Now we know what it is to be transformed. We are to cease the likeness that we now hold and grow up unto the likeness of Him whose we are, Jesus the Christ. I'm always intrigued with the story about the man at the beautiful gate who sat there begging alms. Peter and John went up at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to the afternoon hour of service and they found this crippled man sitting there, this man begging alms. The Bible says that they said unto him, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. 
He felt new health surging through his limbs. He felt strength coming to his withered limbs, and he jumped to his feet. He walked inside that gate, leaping and praising God because he had been gloriously healed. Well, do you think the people are all happy about that? You're wrong. The people, the critics, the scribes, and the Pharisees looked upon him as proof of the divinity of Jesus Christ and his cause, so they despised him. The Bible says they took knowledge of the men who had done this good deed that they had been with Jesus. That's what the Bible says. In other words, they looked like him, they acted like him, they talked like him, they were like him, and though they thought they were criticizing these men, actually, I want you to know, they were complimenting these men. And if ever in your life you've lived such a good, noble, upright, godly life until somebody says, that man's acting just like Jesus Christ, he may say it in the greatest of derision, he may say it in the greatest of spite. You consider that the greatest compliment you will ever get upon this old earth, this side of the pearly gates of immortal splendor, because that's the very thing that we yearn to be, is more like the Lord, to grow more into His likeness from day to day. We are expected not to conform to our present surroundings, but to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Then people will see Him in us. Yes, the Bible said they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. But there is a danger in not standing up for the Lord. There is a danger in not being different. This is a fiery dart, and don't you ever doubt it. And the devil is using it with great success. It is the weaponry of the devil. Evil communication corrupts good manners, the Bible still says. But you know, every now and then, I meet people who tell me, oh, that's an old fogey back number position you've got. You're sure not a modern preacher, I can tell that. I see right now you haven't come out of the, uh, out of the late seminaries. Well, you better believe it. That's right. I still believe sin is sin, and I still believe sin will damn your soul and send you to hell, regardless of what shape or color it is. But we've got people nowadays who say, oh, we're in a modern day. You can take a little of this into your life, and it's going, not going to bother you much if you know how to handle it, of course. Don't let it get the upper hand. You keep the under, upper hand of it. Well, it's like one of the preachers I read after one time. I believe his name was Sam Jones. He said, you can raise a pig in your living room if you want to. Something's going to change when you do, and it won't be the pig. Well, that's exactly right. You can keep sin in your life if you want to, and there's going to be some changes made, and it's not going to be with the sin, except it's going to get bigger, and it's going to get worse from day to day. Some Christians make me think of this little lizard that we have in the South. God equipped this little creature with a survival device. And for a lizard, it's a fine thing. He turns the color of everything he crawls over. If he crawls over a green leaf, he turns green. If he crawls over a brown stick, he turns brown. Then when he crawls over a gray tree trunk, he turns gray. Somebody said they threw one on one of Grandma's crazy quilts and he stripped a gear. I wouldn't vouch for that, but that's sort of the way some church members are. They yield to whatever their surroundings are. The Apostle Paul said, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. One of the dangers this yields is it makes our influence useless. We can never be as powerful for the Lord if we go along with the crowd. A man who has been broken by sin's temptation can never be as influential or as useful as he used to be because there's a certain penalty he's going to have to pay for sin, whatever it was. The Lord will forgive you. You can be saved and you can go through life a forgiven person. But there's always going to be scars and marks left, and you're going to have to bear them as long as you live. That's the penalty. Paul said, Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. All right, let's go on. I want to notice another fiery dart. And you know what it is? 
It's materialism. It's the desire for material accumulation. Now, I'm trying to be reasonable. I think I'm reasonable. I know we have to have a certain amount of this world's good to get along down here in life. At least we think we do. But, you know, I don't think we have to have as much of this as we sometimes think we have to have. I don't think we have to have as much of this stuff as some people obviously think they need because some people have abandoned everything else that's just, noble, right, pure, holy, and everything else just to get a little more of it. And that's all they spend their every waking moment in contemplation of is how to get another dollar. And it doesn't matter how they get it. It doesn't matter over whom they tread to get it. They get it. That's their religion. And too often, this creeps its unwelcome way into the church of the Lord. We find people today who are quite bent on this particular thing. Oh, they appease themselves and make themselves think, I'm being reasonable. You know, I, I go to church. Sometimes while they're sitting on the pew, they're thinking about how they can make a thousand. Sometimes while they're in the church house, they're studying about how they can make another hundred. The Spirit causes men to do some strange things and causes them sometimes to do anything that they might gain a little more of this world's goods. Evil men can be hired for only a pittance to take a life. The love of money is the root of all evil, 1 Timothy 6. The Bible still says the love of money is the root of all evil. Robbery and thievery exist on about every hand and people who seek after ill-gotten gain. This is not just confined to that thief who stealthily sneaks into your house under the cover of night and takes your possessions, or the fellow who will take a handgun and stick you up on the highway. Sometimes this lust for filthy lucre will cause the merchant to tip the scales in his favor or figure into his bill things that are not right and just, just to get your money. These are all the darts of the devil. Sometimes a brother will put a desire for worldly goods before his duty to God, before his duty to his family and to his children even, and will make every excuse on earth for staying away from the church services. I've had people who've stayed at home for just about everything you can think of and then come up to me with the old idea that the ox got in the ditch. Don't you know? Haven't you heard back in the old Bible that when the ox got in the ditch, you're allowed to free him on the Sabbath day? Sure, I know about that, but I'm sort of like another fellow said one time. If I had an ox that got in the ditch every Sunday, I'd either fill up the ditch or sell the ox. I'd make some kind of arrangement about that deal because God's not going to justify a fellow when he gets to the judgment bar of God. Ox or no ox when he just continues to rebel against his blessed and holy word. One thing we need to get real straight in our minds, and that's this. There are some things better than gold. And if you can ever get people to understand there are some things better than silver and gold, they've got it made in the shade. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor than silver and gold. Have you got a good name today? Guard it jealously. Don't let anyone rob you of your good name. That's just about one of the most precious things you'll ever have. Peace of mind is something else that's better than gold. And if we can ever make the devil understand, we're not interested in all this proffered offers, all of his offers to lead us astray from our God and our duty and the church, because therein only can we have peace of mind. We will be a great person. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. We'll tell you how you can get a copy of this message right after our song.
I hope you've enjoyed our message today on Satan's fiery darts. This is a little bit different than what we usually do. This lesson is a sermon from a sermon book um, that's put out by uh, Johnny Elmore uh, from Linwood Smith. Linwood Smith was a preacher of the gospel for uh, well over 50 years who recently passed away. And thankfully these sermons have been preserved. Linwood was an amazing preacher. He was like a grandfather to me on my dad's side. My dad's father wasn't a member of the church and I looked up to him and so enjoyed spending time with him and hearing him preach. Linwood Smith is also a very special individual, not just because of his great preaching ability, but because of his outstanding songwriting ability. He's one of the outstanding songwriters he was within the Churches of Christ. Not only did he write songs, but he also put out a new songbook every two years. In fact, many of you have written us and asked for information about these songs, asked for copies of songs, asked if there was any way to get a CD or a DVD just of the singing. And the work of uh, these songs was part of the great work of Linwood Smith, always putting out uh, a new songbook and putting before uh, Christians, members of the church, some of the recent songs that have been put out by members of the Church of Christ. And so we hope that uh, this study is interesting to you. And next week we'll continue in this study, the second part, and, and conclude this message on Satan's fiery darts. Again, our, our topic was taken from Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse 16, where the Bible says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. One of the fiery darts that God will uh, help protect us from is the fiery dart of false doctrine. Today there are those who have been taken away from the truth of the gospel. After having learned and obeyed the truth, they've wandered away from it. And there are now members of organizations that don't teach the truth about salvation as we've noticed in recent weeks. Remember, Jesus says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We pray that you have heard God speak to you through His Word. If you'd like to get a copy of this sermon, Satan's Fiery Darts, number 856, please contact us at the address on your screen. We also offer our free Bible study course that you can complete at home. We always welcome your comments and your questions. We encourage you to visit our website and watch videos of the program at your convenience at LetTheBibleSpeak.com. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16:16, 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.